Good morning. We bid you welcome and thank you for your interest in migration experiences in Central America to the United States. This group has been working for some years now on this, and today they're going to share their learnings in helping boys, girls, adolescents, and young people. Our panelists, Angeo, feminist, human rights defender, advocate in favor of women, girls, boys, and adolescents working for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, working on regional projects and advocacy. Francisca Cruz, a four-voice young leader and researcher committed to advocate for the success of different styles of learning for students in San Francisco, California. Mr. Lopez, human rights defender of young people and 30 years of experience in processes of protection and restitution, Tonari member, and since 2010, family for child, uh, global network member. Before moving on, something that just reminded me of conversations we've had, something that the author Eduardo Galeano said, I believe it reflects the style, the way in which these sessions provide services and how this project has been developed. I don't believe in charity, I believe in solidarity. Charity is humiliating because it is exerted vertically from the top down. However, solidarity is horizontal and it implies mutual respect. I have a lot to learn from others and thank you. Without further ado, Dioema, I'll pass you the floor. I'm going to talk about Family for Every Child, Global Alliance. Good morning. Thank you. It is really a pleasure to be here with you because we have been working on this project since 2019. All organizations that we're going to present are part of the Child Protection and Military Action. Imagine having a high impact, long duration project with the associations committed for children and adolescents in Mexico. We've had a fantastic cooperation and solidarity experience. This alliance, as you can observe, has a global presence in 43 countries and 37 organizations being very visible. This is part of uh, a research project in different stages and in the ones that we are participating. Next slide, please. Here, what the Family for Every Child Alliance is doing, and um, this helps to work collaboratively as we're doing in this project. How does family work? Through working groups, and this is a research coming and children in movement. That's where this is coming. Three organizations are participating. We have the intention, you have been listening to results or working in the North Corridor. As you know, it's the longest corridor with higher transit and we want to identify what's going on in each of the three countries. We have the, the one, the, the CONASIM in Guatemala, Fundacion Juan Coney in Mexico, that's where I'm from, and Legal Services for Children. And this commitment from all of these organizations working in time. You have two QRs, one so that you can see the virtual gallery of the work we have, not only for Latin America, but all the work done the Family for Every Child Alliance, especially with, and in the other QR you have a report from Mexico said that you know how this is the stories that the young people are retelling. Thank you. Okay, Miguel, you're next with the situation of mobility in Guatemala. Good morning, everyone, all of you. It is a great pleasure to be 
here having the opportunity to experience to share this working experience i want to talk a little bit about the context from guatemala first of all it's an important reflection guatemala is not a poor country guatemala is a historically impoverished country with the characteristic of many corrupt governments and a lot of impunity. That has tied me development and doesn't allow for comprehensive children's development in our country. Other element, we're approximately 16, a little bit over 16 million people according to the last census and above 43% of this is for children and 63 percent are younger than 30 years of age so we're talking about an eminently young population and when you talk with them and you ask them what would you like to do the first thing coming out of their mouths is leaving for the united states unfortunately because there is an absent state a state that doesn't guarantee the compliance with the rights of children and adolescents in our country. Some indicators, Guatemala, unfortunately, is not an honorable figure. I believe 49.6% of total of children are suffering from malnutrition, the highest rate in Latin America, the third worldwide. One of every two children in Guatemala suffers from malnutrition that stunts physical growth and cognitive growth as well. Unfortunately, Guatemala doesn't invest. Safe children has a space to be able to analyze the topic of investment in Guatemala. And Guatemala is the region in, the, in Central America that invests the least in uh, children and adolescents, just under a dollar for health and education. Also, the topic of migration, this is not, we know that migration is a right, we know that, but in Guatemala, people don't migrate because at some point they would like an aspirational objective. Actually, it's a means of survival. There is no warranty of rights in our country. I'd say that unfortunately, the topic of migration in Guatemala, there's a double discourse and a double morality, a double standard here, because migrants from Guatemala, approximately 4 million in the United States alone, are contributing to the GDP in Guatemala up to 23%. That is, they invest much more of what the big entrepreneurs invest in the country being for export, exports or foreign capital to invest in Guatemala. So basically the ones who support the economy are the migrants. And it is not acknowledged, there is no recognition, there is no state policy to guarantee social protection neither for them or back in the country for their own families. Well, Lastly, it's important to state of the many boys and girls who are detected, like they say in Mexico, they are seized and they are returned back to Guatemala. That's a topic for great conversations, but hopefully, please, this is a relevant point, just do the follow-up. Thank you, Miguel. Now we're gonna talk to the OEMA, mobility in Mexico. Let me show you quickly a map in Mexico. This project shows the differences of the profiles that Miguel was saying between children and adolescents in mobility. There are families and unaccompanied children on the move with other families. And there are points where a lot of people go through and you can see these hot areas. Mexico is not only a transit country, it is a country in which the children are being left behind. And something important is the profile of children and adolescents have changed. 
I'm going to show quickly in the next slide, the next one, please, how the profile has changed. We are talking about children from the Northern Triangle and we have seen the changes with Venez children from Venezuela, from Colombia, from Haiti. And this profile since 2018 has been changing. The phase of uh, children's migration in Central America has been changing, it's different now. And we have to do follow up on these cases from other places. Something that happened that seemed important in data gathering beginning in 2024, we have an interactive panel from which you can extract monthly statistics as to what's happening with children. What I'm telling you now is the counting of these statistics from the beginning of this project since September 2019 until January 2024. If you can see, the graphs are very clear, which are the ages and the profiles of unaccompanied and accompanied children. If you see the volume, we used to talk about migrant children. Now we talk about boys, girls, and adolescent migrants. And this calls the attention strongly in Mexico because this requires differentiated specialized attention, especially with consciousness of this mobility surging. Not only children coming through Mexico, but also Mexican children as well. You know, we have a high population, 40 million. Uh, so this is a big population. And it, this is not only the migration wave that comes, but also our own migration going. Frank, you have the floor now. Thank you, Diama. Let me talk a little bit about the situation in the United States with minors, juveniles in detention. Niñas. This is some of the data, boys, girls, and minors younger than 18 years of age up to May 2024, over 7,500 minors detained in the migration office, our, our, our office for relocation. ORR during that period has detained 8 total close to 61,000 minors. Out of this total, 48,000 minors were released. They got their freedom into other counties in the United States, including 600 minors who were released under freedom in San Francisco and Alameda counties. And they have their first legal representation for free for these young people to request migratory relief. Stephanie Fernando, maybe they know about that. But three countries of origin with the highest percentage of children or minors immigrated to the United States are coming from Guatemala, followed by Honduras and El Salvador. These figures beyond the numbers represent different stories of different young people that we need to learn. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you for sharing all that data and the work done by each of the organizations in this corridor, corridor from Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States. So I have some questions. Francisca, your migration experience and the Four Voice project in San Francisco, California. But before, those who have never heard of Four Boys, I'm going to share a little bit how this technique was used. And maybe, who has ever taken a picture? Ever. Perfect. You're almost experts. Photo Voice method is a participatory action methodology using pictures or photographs for gathering and analysis of data. So they can register and reflect these strong points and the worries from the community. 
and the project involved boys and girls and adolescents and young people in the corridor of Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States. And you could see how children advocate by themselves or for themselves. These pictures also helps disseminating knowledge and critical dialogue in the community so that people through can debate in group through the images taken. The photo voice journey that you can see here, photography promotes knowledge and reaches the political leaders to achieve and effect changes. This is a very flexible and adaptable method. Apparently it's fun to use. Children and young people enjoy using it. It's very creative and it works perfectly well with these children. And they seem to be very happy snapping pictures, creating video and sharing their experiences. Something important to highlight is that the group use this beyond a research technique. This serve as a psychosocial tool used by members of the support staff already established for boys, girls, and young people who participated in the project. This was done for providing proper support, especially when participants share traumatic experiences. They had difficult conversations. Um, this was a strategy to be able to provide a service that was related to this trauma. During the participation, each participant could share through the, the photography records uh, their life experiences and being able to affect advocacy. So Francisca, tell us a little bit about your migration experience and how did you get engaged in photo voice, especially around San Francisco? My experience in migration began in 2015 when I was 14 years of age. I come from a small town called Chiapas. I decided to go to Tijuana from Chiapas so I could cross the border. I was traveling by myself. I arrived in some stranger's house. For three days I was drilling myself, learning my new data, my new name, my new date of birth, my new parents' names, and it was really stressful being alone at that age, especially because I left my my siblings behind, my little brothers and sisters and my mother, but I left them back. That's fine. Take your time, Francisca. Take your time. She has been involved in this project for many years now. And she began as a participant, then as a researcher, now she is a young leader. And her journey has been long, but very valuable. That's why she's here with us. During those three days, I was scared, really fearful. I just didn't know if I was going to be able to go across to the other side. I was only 14 years of age, and my only thought was to reach to the other side. I wanted to change my future. I wanted to change the future of my little sisters. I was just saying to myself, I have to get there. I have to work so I can come back and help. And at some point, I wanted to give up. I wanted to say, I need to go back to my home. I want to go back to my mother. I was a girl, I was only 14. But I know if I went back to that little town, no future, getting married at a very young age and just bearing children, I didn't want that, I wanted something more. Thank goodness I was able to go across, I did it well. Nothing happened to me. I was really fearful of being cat kidnapped or worse because I was in a town full of strangers. But the big reason 
that gave me courage and purpose and not giving up. At 12, my father pulled me out of school, but I wanted to continue work, uh, working in my studies. I wanted to become a teacher. And all of that crumbled down because my father had the mentality that women have no voice in this town and women cannot move ahead with education. Women are only good for being in the kitchen and burying children. All of this, that's exactly what I did not want. I wanted something else. My aunts and uncles offer help if I went over there and work with them. That's why I went across the border into the United States. I wanted to work and send money back. And what young people think at that age, you know, being in San Francisco, being in California, they have a different law that states that children ought to be in school and not working. And at that, at that age, I didn't want to study anymore. I just needed to make money. I had to pull my family out of poverty, but I didn't know that once I got into school, my life was going to change completely different. I enrolled in school a school of migrant children or of children of migrant people. I didn't even know English or good Spanish. And I got to know family for every children and they were like my guardian angel. They provided legal services completely for free. And they gave me wings. They gave me the hope of seeing my parents again. And after five years, I was able to acquire my residency. I went back and visited my mother and I had not seen her since I was 14. And I realized that education was going to change my life. I was going to be able to have my voice and to have a career and this was back in 2019, I completed high school. Thank goodness I got scholarship to continue on to college. And in 2023, I graduated from California State University where a sociology, sociology major. Y ahora? And now? I am doing what I really wanted to do in Mexico. Now I am working in a high school as a professional, helping young people and other young migrants, and also providing them hope by telling them my story, letting them know that at one point I was just like them. And I thought that continuing studies was a waste of time, but of course not. I am so grateful for having had a second chance and that made me being able to be where I am and this is what I love. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisca. You shared a lot. Thank you very much. You have done all the work. Legal services for children cannot take credit of none of the decisions that you have made. You have guided us through the route and the objectives that we have achieved. And thank you very much because we have learned a lot from you. We continue to learn from you. Very well. Now you're going to share how you got involved with the Photo Voice project in San Francisco. Well, as I was saying, U.S. services provided so much help to me. Beatrice allowed me to work in Photo Voice in order to get other people to get to hear my experience through images to photography. My first engagement was as a participant. Photo Voice helped me, but not just me. Many children were also helped in a way of how we were able to express what we were feeling the routes that we were, we went through, the journey, and we shared our stories and our voices through photography. 
I took that picture or I had I drew that image or that illustration to share how I felt. Each young person has a different story to share, and our stories are very different, but with photo voice, we're able to come together through photography or images and share our voices and how we feel through illustrations. You're also going to share other images, right, or other illustrations. I just want to clarify that this is not just to my voice. This is the voice of many other young children these are photos from other participants. This one is called the River of Tears. The river um, is, uh, is the meaning of all of the tears that have been shed by each adolescent. The moon and its light is the support from our family and the support that we receive. The wolves are the people that do not allow us or an obstacle on our way. This was called Machete. When I left toward the United States, I wasn't able to get a passport, none of that. So what I had, it was all I had, and that was my machete, a backpack, and a cross. And travel through the jungles with a strong mindset, focus on what I wanted to achieve. That's the picture of the machete. Machete became a tool to protect myself and a tool for survival. And this one is a picture of the sunset. Immigrants can be a victim of organized crime or be kidnapped in our path or even a die in the desert as we try to cross the river. Now my next question, which is a very important question, what are your recommendations or recommendations from the other people that worked in the program of having a more secure and safe immigration. Well, these are the recommendations that come directly from many of the young people that I have worked with. Once again, this is not my voice only, this is a voice of many children and many young adults that I've worked with. Those who seek to find a way of how to be on the move with, uh, with safety. The recommendations from these young adults include the following. Try to not separate families. Provision of water and food to boys, girls, and adolescents and young adults. detention centers in the USA, to educate immigrant law enforcer, enforcement services about the rights of boys, girls, and adolescents, provide the legal, social, and health-related services that would be later be provided to these children, integration of young adults in the United States provide further support and rights of these young adults in order for them to integrate in the society and for them to receive education even after their graduation from high school. These were all of the, for some of the recommendations issued by many of the young adults. There are many more recommendations. For us, I think the most important thing is the first one that I mentioned, not to separate the children from their families. It's, it's, it creates trauma. And once again, this is not my, my voice only. I am the voice of many other children that have been through many different problems. There are other adolescents that have been through worse things. So once again, I'm not only speaking for myself, I am here to be the voice of all the boys, the girls, and the adolescents that were a part of Photo Voice. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca, for sharing all this. As I mentioned before, the project continues. It has several different phases, and Jimena is going to talk about the next phases in which these young adults are working on. Thank you. You have my respect and love. Since we had the opportunity to talk, it's amazing how we how long we've we've uh, we have been and how much we have achieved. 
So this is just one of the many stories of these young adults. When I am before them, I ask them, what does it mean to, for you to have a project that it's long term and that has a great impact? And that is how we came up with Photo Voice. We're currently on our third phase. Next um, slide, please, because this is going to be the voice and it's going to be serve as advocacy at a local and regional level. We are working on creating synergy and working in integration. Acknowledging all of the different actors that we need to, to work with. As Fran just said, there are different voices. There are voices and from the U.S., from Mexico and Guatemala. And yes, we have different profiles and they are different, but they have common uh, concerns. We have similar needs. There, there is cross-border service and we need to be able to amplify the voices and continue with human right protection. From the Alliance, we are working in having greater advocacy at a local and regional level. This project started, it's been five years, and we will continue working in having an, uh, a more advocacy at the public uh, policy level. Let me share other stories from the um, Latin American corridor. And uh, here I'm showing you a QR that you can scan and visit our virtual gallery and the report that comes directly from Mexico. From in here, you'll be able to get further information from the voices of the young adults from Mexico. We really appreciate the time given to us and for being able to be here. Thank you very much. Gracias, Emma. Thank you very much. Thank you for the data and the information shared today. We are now going to set some time aside for the Q&A. Before that, let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists, not only to the speakers that we have before us, but for all the boys and girls from all of the different countries that were also part of this project. Now let's move on to the questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hello, good morning. Thank you very much for your presentation and for sharing your story. You spoke very briefly about uh, the detained children in the United States. From this, I would like to know if any investigation have started to understand the demographics, the health, emotional condition of those children, their ages. Thank you very much. We're going to take three questions and then the questions will be addressed. Hello, colleagues from Legal Services from Children. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to understand what type of advocacy is carried out in relation to boys, girls, and adolescents that are already in the state of California, not those who are detained, but those who are already in the state and are trying to incorporate themselves in the society. You did speak a little bit how you help in, in for the, uh, help them in having access to education. Tertiary education in the United States is very expensive. It's more than $60,000. So how do you help them moving from secondary to tertiary education? Thank you very much. all um as a haitian we have heard stories about many feminization families that are crossing the borders up to mexico and then to reach the united states of america and we have heard about a uh, situation of sexual abuse especially on minors and girls as well as an abdu abduction um, do you have any more information about the scale of those violations as practitioners if any of you could shed some light on this Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. I would like to ask legal services if Stephanie can answer this question. 
She's our colleague from Legal Services, and she's this person re responsible of processing the different cases that Mara just mentioned. And then we'll move on to sexual assaults. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, in regards to the first question, yes, we do have a lot of data. In fact, on our webpage, ORR, you will find data regarding the number of uh, young adults that have come into the United States. You're going to find statistics as to their country of origin, and you will also find information about uh, them being reunited with their families in the United States. So you will also find many different cases that are being handled by different um, um, agencies in the United States, litigation against the United States about the treatment re received by these young adults. We do um, collect or file reports about the treatment of these children receive. And as I mentioned, there are many files um, reported in regards to the treatment given to these children when detained in different centers in the United States. There is one particular case regarding the conditions in which these children are exposed to and migration needs to have a presence. They are there in order to provide different access to children, access such as education, medical treatment, mental services, among all of the different services that should be provided to those children when detained in our centers, including providing and giving them the opportunity to call their families back in their, their countries of origin or even in the United States. So should you want further information regarding the conditions of those children when detained, you can go directly to the Flores, I'm sorry, I forget the name, Flores Settlement, and um, that is currently uh, available. Now, regarding the second question, legal services does work with children that are detained. Fernando and I are two of the many people that work with the project called Young Adults Detained in Legal Services. We provide um, different type of talks uh, regarding the rights that those children have when detained. So we don't necessarily work with solely with those that cross the border or at the border, but also those young adults that are that have just arrived or they have been detained. We provide advisory counseling for them to understand what are their rights when detained and during their detention period. We also provide legal services to them and we provide orientation of how to fight their immigration case while being in the United States, and many times we also represent young adults. So we do have a lot of experience. Personally, I have a lot of experience in um, helping and defending these uh, children in these detainment centers. So we do have a privilege of working, representing, and being the advocates of these children. We continue to provide services after they move out to of this detainment center. Some reports um, about uh, young people being uh, sexually abused at the border, um, as well as on transit to the United States. And even while they are in the United States, um, there has been some litigation. I can't think of specifics, uh, but there have been some news reports um, and exposés around that. Uh, I know that I have worked with many trafficking victims myself, um, and I have uh, thought uh, one, uh, one of the forms of immigration relief is what is known as a T visa. Uh, so if a young person is trafficked in and in, um, in forced to com comply with sexual favors in exchange for being traveled to the United States or in the United States on account of that, 
that is a form of relief that I have sought for young people. So it is unfortunate that that is a consistent um, uh, within um, the various migrant stories of multiple young people uh, and young adults when they are traveling to the United States in transit, while in transit states um, and at the border and even in the United States. Um, so I don't have specifics, but I can assure you that there is reports out there and people are trying to take into account more of these stories because they're so, unfortunately, so frequent. Gracias, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. I just want to add that fortunately, in our previous legislation in Guatemala, we did find some congressmen that supported us. And it was through the Child Commission, which is called the Minor Commission back in, Pan in Guatemala. We work directly with other organizations from civil society. And we visited our areas such as Tapachula to get acquainted with these protection centers where children are placed. We also visited Texas in different areas in Texas to understand the condition in which these children are placed. And we have two reports that we're able to share. One from our visit uh, to Mexico and our visit to Texas. We bring this to your entire disposal so you can look into it. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? Thank you very much. To begin, Francisco, you have my, my true admiration and respect for all of the things that you have achieved and what you represent. To all of you, congratulations for your work. I also admire what you do. I have two things that I would like to, for it to be addressed. Number one, have you identified any changes after the migration measures in place regarding the flow of boys, girls, adolescents that transit to the north? Has there been any changes there? And my second question is related to those boys, girls, and adolescents that go from South America by themselves or accompanied. What type of challenges have you identified in these children, those who are not able to continue their transit in terms of legal services or services that they don't receive that makes them stop? And I also would like to know what type of services are provided at the border? And what type of services are provided uh, to those uh, children and what type of cooperation is provided um, to those children at the border, specifically those um, transits that go from South America to Central America and from Central America to the North? Any other questions from our audience? If not, we have another question, I apologize. This will be the last question. Thank you. Good morning. My question is building on our previous presentation. How can we provide that integrated response, specifically focusing on those young adults that are at the center level. Yes, there is coordination with all the different sectors for us to provide health services among others, but even though they are in these detained centers, our experience in Colombia is that those young adults that are detained, we have a flexible educational model in order for them to continue their education, even though they are detained. It is true that during our presentation, we have spoken a lot about integrated services and about their rights, but how do we ensure that these rights are being in place and how do we work with different sectors in order to provide the services that these children require. I'm going to answer on behalf of Mexico and the work that we carried out in Hukum. We do the cycle social services of those children on the move, whether they're in the condition of refugees or they're in transit and seeking to receive refugee in Mexico. We have been monitoring 
and uh, it has been strengthened through the project, the, the public policy. In fact, back in 2022, there was a law, a migration law and a law for the protection of young adults, which allows us to monitor this. We have an interactive dashboard that I presented. It presents different statistics for us to understand the profile of this population. We know that since 2018, there has been an increase of uh, girls unaccompanying girls and for even other nationalities that we had, did not register. We have uh, registries uh, from the civil society, including other problems related sexual assaults, the returned um, population, and we do see that there are differences from what civil society reports if compared to what's reported to the state. So this allows us to under um, to look into the whys of the discrepancies in what's being reported. As an organization, we are working in developing a route to understand exactly the age groups, the sex, and to better serve them in their, during their route to, to their country of destination. This is something that is very new in Mexico. We do understand that we have a lot to, um, a lot of work before us. The organization Hukum, located in Puebla, Mexico, we provide, like I mentioned, the cycles, emotional services, and we do have a project in working with public uh, policies. What I can say is that we, ha we have learned of the work that's carried out in Guatemala and the work carried out from legal services that allows us to have a greater voice. I would like to share that in Guatemala, since 2023, there was a new migration policy that was in place. We are currently working with a great deal of responsibility from with civil society in order to implement this policy. Currently, I can say that the amount of children, whether they're accompanied or non accompanied, that are crossing the Guatemalan territory has not decreased at all. In fact, it continues to grow. The characteristic is that in the past, we had certain nationalities that uh, seek to arrive, and we also have the caravans that will come directly from Honduras. However, today we have a great deal of populations uh, or different nationalities such as Haiti and Cuba and uh, well, in, in individuals that come from Africa and Asia. One of the main challenges that we have is that the state does not guarantee education, health, nor protection to boys and girls. So in that sense, we are concerned because the last pro reports that have been issued, we have identified that law enforcement in Guatemala, unfortunately, is very corrupted. Therefore, this poses another challenge to the population on the move. They are, well, the reports state that they have robbed them and they're also subject to extortion from law enforcement. The other situation are maras and the gangs that are high risk in Guatemala, especially for those people on the move. In Guatemala, as you may know, it is not a country where people, where depending on their social or political status, they're not people that are on the move. And uh, because of the condition of our country, people that migrate to Guatemala do not intend to stay. They are currently in transit and they want to move out of Guatemala. Many of the individuals that come to Guatemala are large families, and many of them are, or the women that come are delivering their children in Guatemala. And the difficulty is here is that they do not want to register their children 
in Guatemala. So that is another problem because we can't guarantee the identity in order to enforce the protection of those children or not able to provide the service because they don't want to register their children in Guatemala. Their expectation is to um, reach Mexico or United States and register their children over there. So these are the different challenges that we are seeing. With GONAPI, we work with family in order to achieve two objectives. Number one, to prevent family separation. And number two, finding ways of how we strengthen the processes of the reintegration of those children with their families. Regarding education, we understand that they, it must be guaranteed during the time they are in Guatemala. However, this is not happening. We find many children next to their relatives or their parents um, next to a traffic light or those who are unaccompanied trying to survive by selling sweets or candies or they're living by themselves in the park. We are in a process of a change in office in Guatemala, and we hope this changes. Previous off of, um, government did not guarantee the protection of these populations. Regarding the second question and the conditions for, and uh, access to medical services and mental health services in the teens. This is something that is performed by the ORR because they're under the custody of ORR. Fernando and I um, talk to the young adults to let them know that they have the right to get these type of services. However, we have no way to contact those services or even um, provide any recommendation. All we do is we issue the information to the detainees and we also speak directly to the officers from the detention centers for them for them to know that those children or young adults are, are have the right to have access to different type of services and after interviewing the detainees if these we identify that they are not receiving the service that this is that they should receive then we go back to the officers of the centers to let them know that those uh, children should receive the services that they need and um, we also file complaints and if these services are not provided. Now, regarding the services that we carried out with those detainees, um, Alejandro and I will share a presentation tomorrow regarding the type of work of advocacy that we do for these children. So once again, this is, we share the, the rights of those uh, adolescents and young adults, and we make sure that they do receive their services. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And we didn't ask Stephanie, but she has helped today, and thank you so much. Well, not enough time now, and thank you to the panelists, and thank you to all of you for being present here today.